Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here and lo lovely to see some familiar faces. Um, and welcome to this Pativity quarterly economic update. And thank you all um, for those of you who, who have added your worries so far to our John Ashcroft wall of worry. Um, we hope you found it very therapeutic this morning. Um, my name is Paul Middleton and I'm joined here today by my colleagues from Pativity and our sister company, Robert Half. Um, as I say, it, it, it's great to see you all here again. Um, today we are talking, um, as the title suggests, about the future of the economy. And, and doesn't it feel a very apt time to do that? We thought we'd found our way out of the woods, um, but as you were just saying, you know, what, what isn't there to worry about at the minute? We thought economic confidence was rising, but last week, bang, a new variant, borders are shutting, financial markets are wobbling, masks are returning, and confidence taking a hit. So are we heading back to the woods, or is this just a stumble in our path back to normality, whatever that normality is going to be? So to lead the debate today and to answer all those questions as normal, um, and more importantly, your questions, I'm delighted to welcome back Dr. John Ashcroft. As some of you may remember from his appearances in our collaboration forum and, and earlier economic forums, John specializes in economics, strategy, financial markets, and works with professional firms, large corporates, and, and SMEs. He's the author of the Saturday Economist, his weekly blog published on a website of the same name that some of you may subscribe to discussing the UK and the world economy. And if you look in the chat, uh, there'll be a link to that there now. John specializes in viral modeling, and it's this combination of modeling and statistical fueled economics that's resonated with so many of you before. So we thought we'd bring you an update on his insights, perspective, worries, challenges, and hopefully as normal his optimism. Um, so before I hand over to John, I just wanted to reflect on your feedback so far. I don't know how many of you have managed to um, to fill in the wall of worry, but if you just show the results so far, Becky, um, this will, if you just share your screen, that will just arm John to make sure his analysis takes your concerns head on. Um, so, okay, I thought, I, I thought everyone would be saying pandemic, but uh, interesting to see that supply chain recruitment, interest rates are getting hit. Um, so I know that some of you have only just joined, but if you look in the chat, you'll see the survey that will take you to this. Um, so please click on it. It will take you 30 seconds and you can tell us what's on your wall of worry. But clearly everyone's very optimistic about growth, not worried about energy costs, as I just get my email from Bulb telling me uh, they're in administration and digital disruption isn't, isn't a concern at all. So good to see. But uh, yeah, supply chain, John, would seem, um, would seem where to focus some of the discussion. Um, so we'll keep that Thank open you. right up until the end. So please um, keep entering your thoughts. Equally, if your thoughts change, please go in there and um, go back and update what you're thinking. Next week, Prativity, uh, we'll be publishing our 2021-2022 top risk survey based on feedback from our global clients and business leaders on the risks that they think are most critical to their businesses that they need to recognize and address. That's our top risk survey. This, we do it on an annual basis and we will send everyone here a link to it. So it'll be interesting to see how much of a correlation there is between your thinking here in that survey and what John says and that top risk survey. Um, but back to today, John will be presenting his thoughts using some slides um, as normal. So if you have any questions, please ask those questions in the chat um, in the Teams bar. Um, you just click on the left, right hand corner and click on the little speech icon up there or save them up and put your hand up in Teams or, or physically at the end and I'll, I'll come to you then. Um, John will speak for around 40 minutes, plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, but as ever, my plea is that whatever you do, please get involved. Let us know your thoughts as as you getting involved is infectious and ultimately this is this is all of your forum. So John, great to see you again. Thank you for joining us and over to you. Okay, Paul, thank you, Paul. And uh, good morning to everybody. It's uh, good to have the chance to present today. So I do a lot on economics and uh, strategy and financial markets. And um, I'm gonna pull up my slide deck. This is a moment of truth as we get this together. Here we go. Yes. OK, so. So.
So this is a slide deck for today's presentation. Uh, the challenge is to uh, check out and foresee the risk that we don't yet. It reminds me of Donald Rumsfeld, this sort of there are known knowns, there are unknown knowns and unknown unknowns. So we're not going to touch many of the unknown unknowns, but we will be looking at um, the economy, financial markets, and also new today, we'll be talking about um, forward guidance. I do the Saturday Economist, do a Monday morning market review on financial markets, and today we're previewing the first ever reveal of uh, what we call the Friday forward guidance, where we look at interest rate possibilities across the US, Europe and the UK. So what we've seen is the recovery UK growth has been faster than expected, uh, not just in the UK, but across the world and especially in the USA. There are worries about signs of overheating in the economy in the US and to a lesser extent in the UK and in Europe. Certainly, the Fed's getting very worried about overheating now and inflation. So we're talking about four topics, the world economy, quick look at the world economy, prospects of the UK, what's happening to prices and inflation, and also what's happening to interest rates. Mervyn King, uh, Mervyn King was challenging the current central bank crop as being acting more like King Canute and assuming their role as proper bankers. And um, Andrew Bailey, governor of the Bank of England, was saying that forward guidance, his own words this, for guidance is murky, especially given the words the Bank of England use. So we're going to try and look through some of the scenarios. And I think the important thing is in business at the moment now, it's pretty important to have your scenario evaluations. To a lesser extent for growth, we're pretty sure about growth, notwithstanding the latest uh, COVID uh, episode with Omicron. But it is important to have a you know, scenario outlook for inflation and also interest rates. So trying to understand what's been going on then we have what we call this economic shock, the economic shock of COVID. And that created, as we have talked about last time, this seismic event, the sort of seismic event with tectonic shifts in these two plates of supply and demand. So demand has bounced back severely and the supply chains have been inhibited for whatever reason. So they're struggling to catch up, especially in shipping, but also in chips, uh, computer chips, I mean. Uh, silicon chips, but also in other supply side materials. So the seismic shift as the economy bounced back from the shock of last year has created this tectonic shift in the place of demand and supply. And in the US, it's been compounded by a dose of helicopter money. OK, you're quite right. Those who said last time, QE or asset purchase programs from the Fed and central bankers, that's not necessarily helicopter money. But the US have had their dose of helicopter money as well when checks signed by the former president, Donald Trump, he wanted to put his picture on it, let alone his signature. But the checks went out to households in the US and also checks went out from Joe Biden. Something like four billion or trillion went into the economy, pushing consumer demand on top of the stimulus from QE. And this created on top of the tsunami, this seismic event, this tsunami of dollars, that this money has been flashing into the US economy, which is why we think uh, inflation has been particularly exacerbated. Having said that, there was a shock of the numbers from the EU last week. But nevertheless, this is what compounding the problem of excessive demand in the US. In addition, from a labor recruitment point of view, there's been a reassessment of work-life balance, especially amongst the Generation Z. And we've talked a lot about Generation Z and done some work on Generation Z with our dimensions of strategy work. So if you don't subscribe to the study economists yet, then do that because you get with it notes on GZ, but you also get notes on the Monday morning markets, those of you worried about financial markets, and we also do our notes on uh, now coming soon, the financial Friday forward guidance. Now, this all leads to our wall of worry. We try and list everything anybody could ever be worried about. So we talk about the pandemic, growth, inflation, interest rates, recruitment, retention, sourcing, supply chain, energy costs, shipping costs, global conflict, watch out for Taiwan and Ukraine, global tensions, <laughs> in uh, Eastern Europe and in uh, Southeast Asia and the South China Sea, extreme weather events, ESG perspective, Zedders, Generation Zedders, digital disruption, digital accommodation, and the metaverse. If you're not up to speed with your digital online presence at the moment, well, get ready because the metaverse is coming as well. Probably missing out there cybersecurity, but there's quite a lot that everybody should be worrying about all the time. And this is why it's important to have this scenario evaluation. So. Going back to the economy, the economies have been growing at an eye-popping rate. And when we look at the latest IMF world growth forecast though for October, they're projecting a recovery in growth this year of around 6% for the global economy after a 3% setback last year. And there'll be about 5% growth next year. 
So really we're steady state in the advanced economies and also in the emerging markets economies. And I think when we look at growth projection for the US, we'll touch on this in a moment in greater detail, but in the EU on track for growth of 5% this year and maybe 4.5% next year, that generally the world looks set for steady state growth, barring a black swan and barring exacerbation of Omicron. Now, in addition, we know that world trade has been bouncing back, a staggering recovery in world trade. And I think you had the situation last year where tra uh, container capacity was being cut in Q2, it was being cut by 10%, which has led to the uh, additional problems this year. But when we look at the trend lines, sorry, loads of graphs in here, those of you who love graphs, that's good. If you don't, well, bear with me, but world trade is up by 22% in the second quarter, and it's up by 15% probably in the year as a whole. And this enormous surge in world trade has caught container traffic on the hop. We've seen already problems with containers piling up at Felixstowe and vessels diverted from the UK back to Rotterdam for smaller scale assembly. And we've seen these incredible problems in the US. It's not just in the UK, but in the US, they have problems. Not only are they struggling to get the containers or the ships into the containers into the docks, they can't get the containers out of the docks. So something like, you know, they're struggling for HGV drivers, they're struggling with chassis capacity, they're struggling for um, container capacity. There's something like 60 or 70 ships at anchor off the west coast of America at the moment, tying up uh, containers and deliveries. This is compounding the supply side problems which everybody is beginning to experience uh, at the moment. And this is a great chart, forgive me, it's a great chart from Bridgewater Associates. And here it looks at what's been happening with the trend in the blue line of the demand, the nominal demand recovery in the US for consumer goods and the trend rate of supply, that's the red line, uh, the lower line, which is showing the global real production of goods for US consumers. Now, you don't have to be a mathematical genius or a PhD economist to realize these lines are out of kilter. And there's another analysis from McKinsey, which shows it in even more sharp detail. So the chart on the left shows the surge in retail sales, including dining places in the US. So it's like shooting way above trend. There's been an element of you know this um, strong bounce back in the economy, this tsunami of, uh, of dollars surging into the economy, pushing consumer spending even higher. And this has meant that, and there's been an element of hoarding and double bubble for, you know, for certainly for some retail suppliers where they've been stocking up. This is compounding the, the demand side problem. So from a supply side point of view, not only is demand surging, but container capacity has been shrinking because the containers are getting blocked either in the docks or on the ships or uh, struggling. Even they're empty, they can't get them back into circulation. And this chart shows the relative supply of containers. So there's a big cutting capacity through 2019. Then this surge in demand in, um, in, in, in sorry, surge in custom capacity in 2019 and 2020, especially in 2020 Q2. And then this sort of uh, collapse in availability of containers, which is all compounding the supply side. And when we look at um, the dwell times, the dwell times for, you know, it's taking another 30 days to get the uh, containers across the sea, but they're being hung up by an initial five days at the moment. So 30% of the container capacity is, is sticking around for five days or more. Then there's the element of pricing. And what we've seen is that, you know, the shipping a container from China, East Asia to the Northwest Coast of America hit 20,000 bucks in $20,000 in uh, September. And now we see it's coming off the top to about $14,500 at the moment. So the good news is that some of these supply side issues that will fade. The bad news is some reckon it'll take to Q3 next year before we see a real alleviation of uh, a reassignment of container capacity, maybe by Q2 and maybe sort of chips shortages relieved by Q3 or possibly Q4 next year. So what we see is, going back to economics for a moment, that this deficit with China, this so-called deficit with China that US was trying to eliminate with the tariffs, that's just not happening. And so now we're gonna look at the specific economies of China and the US uh, before looking at detail at the UK. So in China, they're still on track for growth of 8% this morning. Now there's a whole big wave of anti-China sentiment coming forward at the moment. And you know, the economy is, yes, once again, on the brink of disaster. The head of MI6 was saying that China are using LinkedIn, believe it or not, their spy chiefs are using LinkedIn to gain data on, um, on key workers in the UK, heaven forbid. And as we know, Ian Duncan Smith was railing against the risks of TikTok as being a security risk for the economy. A lot of this is clearly 
overdone, but it's winding up tensions, especially in Taiwan, uh, as we saw from uh, the Japanese prime minister this week or yesterday. So anyway, it's on track for growth of 8% this year. It is what we talk about the return of the Middle Kingdom, where 35% of uh, of economic activity is this is key Asia Pacific region, which is really going to be dominated by China, especially when Fed pull, uh, uh, Trump pulled out uh, a lot of US influence in that zone. And it will overtake the US economy, we think, by 2028. And it's on track to double in size by 2035. Already, as we've said before, the largest economy, second largest economy in the world, still struggles to get in the top 50 in terms of GDP capacity. So lots of lots of potential to grow. And we see that, uh, you know, the yen or the the renminbi could, will become at some stage the new reserve currency. Currently, currently transactions currently dominated by uh, the dollar, the euro, and the sterling to a lesser extent. Now, in the U.S., we've seen that now the adults were back in the White House. We said, but currently they're squabbling about their current roles. But even so, they'll get clean growth around six percent this year, slowing to four point five percent next year. And the unemployment rate is on track to ease back towards uh, 4.5% as we move towards uh, through 2022. The inflation rate <clears throat> peaking now at about 6%. We say peaking, we hope it's peaking. Fed Chair Jay Powell was saying he doesn't think it's quite as transitory as uh, it was previously, but <laughs> we'll have to see about that. But it, when we look at the internal problems, what we call the twin deficit dilemma in an economy, the internal deficit is still very severe, where the government is spending a lot of money, <clears throat> and the external deficit, uh, the trade deficit, is still very acute as well. And this is, uh, from the spending point of view, the US national debt's about 28.9, several trillion or whatever it is there. So we see short-term strength for the dollar, maybe medium-term strength for the dollar, but in the longer, medium to longer term, the fundamentals will kick in to undermine the position there. And we'll talk about our forward guidance. Uh, the Fed's dotty about the dot plot. They reckon rates will rise by about to 25 basis points by the end of next year. We now think this is out of date, which I'll touch on later. And the prospects for tapering, this is tapering, but nevertheless, tapering, they've already now, they're starting to reduce their asset purchase program, and that will be eliminated at the moment by the end of September in 2022. But uh, j Powell is now hinting it could end even sooner. So that's our look at the uh, world economy, bounce back in the UK, in the world economy, bounce back in world trade, creating incredible supply side problems as the US is scooping up a lot of product from around the world. And we're now going to look at what's happening in the UK. And a lot of charts here, uh, but bear with me uh, as I skip through them. So this is our current forecast for December. Actually, it's not changed much from uh, last time we were presenting. We see growth of about 7.5% this year. It's almost mathematically impossible now not to get growth of uh, between 7 to 8%, given the strength of the performance to year to date. And we think we'll see 5.5% growth next year before reverting to trend. And our scenarios is it could even be higher this year at about 8%. It could be around 7%, which where the consensus is presently. But nevertheless, it looks good for this year and into next year. And when we look at what is happening, uh, we, we, we model a trend rate of growth <clears throat> of around uh, 2%. Uh, and what we see is the setback in the economy last year means gradually we're going to work our way back to trend. Economists always like this reversion to the mean or reversion to normal. And uh, that's what we're seeing in the numbers that we're presenting. And it's the same for what we call GDP output figures, a similar position where the economy will recover towards trend uh, we'll look at the details there. <clears throat> and when modeling inflation or the central bank reaction, it's important to measure the output gap. Where would the economy have been or, or how far is the economy off that trend rate of growth? Um, when we look at inflation, generally inflation this year is going to average out at 3.8% for the year as a whole and in 3% into next year, maybe a bit uh, too optimistic on the next year's trend. But when we look at the figures by quarter, then it's going to peak at between 4.5% Q4 this year and Q1 next year, and it could be as high as 5%. This is our scenario, okay? It's very difficult to give a specific hardline forecast, but nevertheless, we think that inflation will peak around 5% and will return to about uh, 3 to 3.5% by the end of next year, still way above the um, central bank target. And when we look at interest rate expectations, the UK, Bankers get very excited about this. I don't really. But generally, consumers think that inflation is going to be heading to 4% plus in the years ahead. 
A lot of worries about unemployment uh, earlier in the year as the furlough scheme is going to come to an end. But generally now, uh, we're touching greater detail, we think unemployment could well peak just around 5% or maybe below. And when we look at the quarterly figures, it's going to, it could peak up from 4.3% in the latest data to around 4.9%. <clears throat> and it, even then, it'll be sort of a cyclical, um, a sorry, frictional unemployment as there's a reassignment of jobs. Incredible strength in the economy. We've seen vacancies surge to 1.2 million in the latest data. These are the average by quarter. And work from uh, the um, IFS suggests that that will return back towards 750 by the end of next year, so under 50,000. But nevertheless, this, this sort of incredible surge in vacancies to 1.2 million. And again, um, look at average earnings. Average earnings have been peaking at 8.8 percent. A lot of forecasts and negative forecasts on high earnings levels. But when we look at this graph, this shows the trend rate of uh, of earnings around three and a half percent. And what you get is on all these figures at the moment, this real um, dislocation between things as they were and uh, as they are now. So we see that reverting to about three and a half percent as we move into 2022. Um, because it's really a sort of readjustment from, from the highs, notwithstanding the increase in minimum wage and uh, some of the wage disparate recruitment difficulties at the moment. On the labour market charts, as we say, we've got 1.2 million vacancies. These are the sectors, very similar position in the US with dominance in health and social, retail, accommodation and food and professional services. And when we look at the uh, furlough scheme, we see how that drifted down to end up about 1.1 million at the end of September. And it's what happens to that 1.1 million that is going to be interesting. And when we look at the furloughs by sector, this is data for August, and then compare it with the furlough and vacancies, you can see a very high correlation between the figures overall, except in health and social. So basically, there is incredible numbers of vacancies in health and social care, which will pull on um, the economy moving forward, whereas there's lots of expectation we could see a reshuffling of numbers uh, for um, for it, uh, between vacancies and furlough and uh, um, unemployment as we move through this adjustment cycle in Q4 and into Q1. Unemployment, the government like to say unemployments have picked up. Yes, they have, but they're still a bit way off uh, where we were pre-pandemic. And some of this is um, foreign nationals leaving the UK, and some of it, uh, some generational stuff where a lot of people are just quitting the workforce. In the US, the num quit numbers have been extremely high. So when we look at the borrowing figures for government, then Rishi Sunak, the latest data, because it moves around a bit, is about 320 billion um, for um, last year. And we think this year it's going to be at 175 billion. And moving forward, then it moves forward into steady state. So we're less worried now. The markets are less worried about uh, borrowing and less worried about uh, the issues on public sector debt. If you heard me talk before, we talked about this issue of um, the central bank mopping up some of the government debt on the Money for Nothing Guilt for Free program, as we call it. So we don't get overly concerned about because the, you know, the central bank or the Bank of England owns about a third of the debt now. So the liability of Treasury is an asset owned by the Bank of England and both are owned by government. So one day into the future, a bit of slick intergroup consolidation and a third of the debt could disappear. <laughs> Nobody talks about that yet. A bit of detail on universal credit and furlough and the unemployment of millions. That's a summary chart. But I want to just touch on the UK trading goods because the deficits are back on goods. And uh, fortunately, the trade in surplus services surplus helps to offset that. But we think we're on track for a deficit of 20 billion on goods and services into next year, which is a modest 1% of uh, GDP or less, and not of concern to, to uh, markets or bankers or government. Quick look at the difference between EU trade and the EU trading goods. Well, <clears throat> sadly, we're not seeing this. Um, what's happening with newly global Britain is it's just opening up opportunities. So the big shift is there's been a little shift in export balance between EU and non-EU, but there's been a catch up for non-EU. Uh, so there's sort of some uh, acceleration of non-EU imports into the UK. So I'm not a great fan of uh, truly global Britain. It's just opening us up to more competition or more imports from the rest of the world. Quick look at these forecasts. This means that real growth for the UK over the next 
for a couple of years is going to be 15%, add in a bit of um, inflation, and you look at nominal growth of between 20 and 25% for the next three or four years. This is a huge opportunity to, to really expand and grow and the debts will shrink in terms of uh, debt to, to turnover rates for a lot of businesses. Service sector, we see strong growth there. Manufacturing, we're worried about manufacturing. This squiddly bit in the to the right hand side means that, you know, there's been a setback in uh, manufacturing because of supply side shortages. We've seen shocking figures coming out of the car industry because of the chip shortages. But supply side disruptions are causing us to be concerned about uh, the recovery in manufacturing. And I think that generally what we find in every cycle, you know, going back to 1948, every time there's a setback in the economy, the manufacturing sector gets hit. And if you're lucky, it takes 10 to 15 years to get back to where we were. Um, I, I speak as a student of the manufacturing sector over all of these years, having been in that place. So yeah, we're worried about manufacturing and construction to a lesser extent because there have been some supply side difficulties. So that's our overall forecast outlook. And when we look at inflation, we say, is it transitory or is it a tipping point? Well, we know prices are hotting up. This is a detailed chart from our um, monthly inflation outlook analysis. But we can see uh, CPI inflation at 4.2% in October. It's generally reckoned it's going to move even higher in, um, in November. We've seen the figures from the EU this week at 4.9% CPIH inflation in, in November, 5% near inflation in the US, and the UK is probably going to catch up. But on the top right, you see we always analyze in between service sector inflation at 3.2% and goods inflation at 4.9%. And when we look at what's happening, a lot of um, pressures on, on input prices and output prices. Well, we're going to talk about oil next, but input prices have hit 13%. But if you see in the chart, input prices are incredibly volatile. And at the moment, when we model our inflation numbers and when we model output prices, the anomaly here is output prices because we normally expect a pass-through ratio of around... Uh, we get this right around 50% or 60% from input to output prices. Uh, and at the moment, it looks like output prices are increasing ahead of uh, the cost curve overall. But we'll see how that unfolds in the months ahead. But oil, oil is very interesting because, uh, you know, we saw a oil trading at 85, talks of it going to $100. And then there's been a, a real pushback uh, this week or last week when Biden, the US government, uh, release some of the reserves, um, and there was a shock to demand. So that we've seen a big fall back in um, in oil prices. And what has been the surprising thing for lovers of techie geeky things, this is the correlation between oil prices uh, in the blue line and the US uh, rig count, US oil rig count. And what we see is a very strong correlation uh, between, you know, as prices rise, the oil rigs come on stream in the US, and as prices fall, the oil rigs are shut down in the US, but since 2020, that's not been happening. In other words, prices have been rising, but the US has failed to meet the challenge. So currently it's around 467, I think, the oil rig count last week. And we'd expect it to be almost twice that at the moment. And, you know, this pressure on um, on on ESG or uh, and oil, Biden saying, well, you know, mm, forget saving the world economy or the, the world at the moment. We need that oil production to come into place. And if you bear with me, there's another geeky chart here, but this looks at oil prices in terms of the relative change. And this is why those, you know, we're more positive about inflation being a transitory phenomena, because a lot of the price pressures in the UK are uh, oil determinant. But when in, in, in the in Q2 last year, the average oil price dropped to twenty nine dollars. In fact, at one stage it was negative. They were paying people to roll the barrels away in the US. So what you got as prices rallied into uh, 2021 is this say in, in, in Q2, oil at $70 was playing $29 last year. So the inflationary impact was highly incredible. So you look at the average prices in the blue line at the top, the blue chart at the top, and then beneath that is the year-on-year -year inflationary impact. So this big inflationary impact from Q2, which takes <clears throat> maybe a quarter, two quarters to impact the rest of the economy, is unwinding severely, and we expect that to want to be one of the great deflationary episodes of uh, 2022. And it's the same with, um, you know, at the moment worries about lumber prices in the US, they're down by 50% or 60%. What 
whereas by iron ore prices, they're down by 50% from the top. And it's the same with the copper, down by 20%, aluminium down by 10%. But some of the battery elements like nickel and so on, they're still relatively high. So we expect this sort of um, oil prices, energy prices to ease. And we also expect some of the commodity prices, especially the hard metals, to ease into 2022. Big question about gas prices and uh, Nord Stream, uh, especially the future for Nord Stream. Um, at the moment, you know, big issues relating to Ukraine and German acceptance of Nord Stream, whatever. So interesting dilemma there for uh, for the EU. So we say inflation is always and everywhere a transitory phenomena, but sometimes, as we see with the Bloomberg Commodity Index, it sometimes takes a bit longer. So finally, I'm going to look at just a bit about the study economy's Friday forward guidance. We're next for base rates in the UK, US and Europe. This is our three year quarterly forecast. Take this with a pinch of salt because uh, it's a very much work in progress and also trying to forecast what the central banks are going to do around the world is going to be rather challenging. But nevertheless, here goes. So this is the implied four guidance that we give now for UK base rates that we see maybe no hike in December. There's been no hike from a central from the UK central bank in December before Christmas for 50 years or more. And we don't think despite the markets and suggesting it may be, we don't expect any hike this year, especially now with Omicron and with Christmas. But it's reasonable to expect a first hike in the first quarter or late into the first quarter next year before Easter, rising towards, towards uh, um, 75 basis points by the end of next year, and then moving up to about 1.75 by the end of 24. And this is you know, the position that um, we would take as being the, the base case for the moment. In Europe, Christine Lagarde is saying there'll be no increase in, EU, in EU rates through 2022 at all. And maybe then we would say, well, an increase of 25 basis points and then 50 basis points by the end of 23, rising by another 25 basis points. In the US, tapering. We think now there's a 50% or 60% chance tapering will end in June. And now markets are pricing in 50 basis points by the end of uh, next year rising to 175. But when you put those, uh, and that's that's a summary position in that chart, but when you put these three together, this doesn't work, right? Because it's not feasible that uh, US rates or UK rates would rise ahead of the US. So, you know, but it's possible that US rates may rise faster. There's also the possibility that once the Fed and uh, put up rates by 50 basis points, they really start to worry about growth and panic and start to pause or maybe, you know, as we've seen before, they reverse. It's escape from planet Zerp, as we call it, the world of zero interest rates. We try to get off and get lift off before, but really struggle. So at the moment, the estimations would be we'll see uh, US rates up to and UK rates up to 50 or 75 basis points by the end of next year, rising to 175 by 2024. And this should be a reasonable scenario model for any business at the present time. We also look. We also therefore expect that UK, the EU, wouldn't be able to lag because it would put too much pressure on the euro, and they would be likely to follow suit. So this this should be a base, a basic scenario model. You can take, if you like, the European model with no increase next year at all, or you take the the um, UK model we put in there at um, around 50 to 75 basis points for next year. This is the, I'm going to talk about that. This is our implied four guidance from where rate should be. Is the UK behind the curve? Yes, because by according to our modified Taylor rule, which looks at inflation above target and uh, the output gap, um, rate should be about 190 or 175 now. So, so that's why the banks are behind the curve. And this is the, these are the guys who, who are involved as the Bank of England Hawks and Doves. And there's still a chance that uh, Rishi Sunak may have to dip into his uh, trillion pound. He may still be short of money. So we expect the Bank of England may ditch the, um, the 20 billion of corporate bonds it has. Why it bought them, we never know. Why it's held on to them, we never know. We can't be sure that Apple and IBM need the cash. But um, the Treasury may need to lean on the bank as the buyer of last resort for gills. Finally, a quick look at our Monday morning markets. We review this every week. But we reckon the market's about 7.5% overvalued at the moment, especially in the um, uh, US, where it's like 15% overvaluation. Europe, not so bad, and uh, Asia, not so bad. But, you know, the markets, a lot of the, the fund managers, they think the market's overbought and they're looking for a setback. 
And so, you know, when trying to understand market movements and watching the press, we quote Nietzsche in our work and say, any explanation is better than none. The markets are trying to get a setback. They didn't get it with um, with the uh, Omicron. They're trying a bit now with Taper. But um, if there is a setback, it just creates a great buying opportunity. And the implications for gilts, just two talks ago now, but the implications for gilts are that, you know, 10 year gilts at 84 basis points in the UK is absurd. And if they were priced back, the inherent capital loss for, for bonds is, is, is incredibly high. <clears throat> On sterling, we've seen big weakness in sterling, uh, dropping to 133. It looks a bit oversold at the moment, but generally look for fair value around 135. So not much movement there. So going back to it, that was a wall of worry. We covered a lot of the issues. I'm not sure we've sold all of them or any of them or maybe some of them. Uh, but that's the wrap up of um, some of the issues that we've been thinking about. So, John, there you go. John, thank you very much. I wasn't expecting the music there, I have to say. That was, uh, that was good. No, they... um, look, that's fantastic. You covered a huge amount there. Um, I hope you all kept up, everyone. Uh, we'll, give a, we'll give you all a test at the end. Um, Please put your questions in the chat, um, just based on what you've heard from John there. Um, John, you, have as ever, have shown optimism, growth, decreasing unemployment, return to trends. Who, who do you think are currently the winners and losers? And how is this going to change as we gradually return to trend? Well, I think... Um... <clears throat> That's an interesting question. In terms of the winners and losers, we've seen a recovery across the board, really, and we're seeing <clears throat> moment hangups in manufacturing and construction. But generally, notwithstanding the setback that we have with Omicron at the moment, that you know the consumer is going to benefit, households are going to benefit. It just looks like a a real good, strong basis to move forward at the present time. So I think that um, you know it's a good time to plan and. A lot of worries about this um, issues of debt and repayment of some of the debts. But yeah, it's such a great platform to move forward. It's a question of seeing through some of the headline issues, as always, to understand the more fundamentals. OK, thank you. You're still showing your desktop, by the way. Um, I know, I'm trying to get out of that. I just bear with it for a minute. <laughs> That's all right. Top right hand corner, you can just okay, no, right. I got it. It's oh. all right. I lost my Sorry about that. Anyway, That's OK. There's that. Um, so, Supply chain. We saw at 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 the beginning in the um, in the survey we did, and as I say, that survey still open. So please get your your votes in on that wall of worry. When we looked at it initially, we saw that supply chain um, was the worry most on people's mind. Would you agree with that? I think it's a bit of a concern in <clears throat> manufacturing and construction as being critical, especially manufacturing with uh, so so many shortages. And I think. Um, then you know it, that runs on to some of the issues relating to uh, consumer products and consumer durables. But we've got to sort of see through some of the headlines that you know there's a panic about HGV, well, HGV drivers. There's a panic about uh, petrol at the pumps. There's a panic about turkeys. Will there be enough turkeys? So you've got to look some of, through some of the data. But when you look at those disparities for uh, between demand and supply in the US and understanding the container issues at the moment then yeah, supply is an issue because the world is going to take some time to get back to normal. And at the moment, there are problems with COVID, with shutdowns in China, problems in COVID, with problems in uh, in Vietnam and, um, and, and, uh, and so on. So yeah, supply side is a big challenge. And I think that, you know, but logistics guys, good logistics guys, that's what they're trying to do. And I think uh, it's going to persist into next year. And But then, then comes the glut you know, it's a big like the pig cycle, a three year cycle that the glut of semiconductors is going to flood onto the market maybe by the end of next year. And then we'll see this oversupply as uh, as the demand or supply is readjusting to the current level of demand, which will be proved to be excessive. So, you know, you listen to Cathy Woods at ARK Invest, they envisage big deflationary pressures into the economy next year, which may mean that that central bank inflationary outlook and exchange rate outlook looks too aggressive. Thank you, John. Um, I think one of the I think the second biggest one we had out there as well was then retention and recruitment. Leila, do you want to would you agree with that? Do you want to share some perspectives on that and and see what John thinks? Yeah, sure. So, 
I think we've well, we've seen a a second extraordinary year uh, in recruitment. Um, you know, last year things weren't very quiet, uh, as reflected um, in uh, across a number of John's graphs with a sharp dip, um, and then a, and a rise again towards the end of the year in quarter four. That rise has continued into this year, um, and as John said earlier, well. <laughs> Uh, ONS is actually 1.7 million um, <laughs> um, vacancies, um, but you know, if we're going to round up, it probably feels like 2 million vacancies to many people. So, um, yeah, so we've seen what's what's happened this year, particularly in quarter three and continuing to quarter four, is the highest number of job vacancies on record, uh, coupled with the lowest ever number of respondents um, to those vacancies. Uh, in job applications and that data is taken from the job board so I think that's been well publicised. Of course this is leading to um, some challenges you know across a number of sectors um, and within those sectors particular roles um, the highest is tech so any IT uh, you know front middle back support software developers full stack developers software engineers um, these roles remain a challenge for all businesses uh, of all sizes in all sectors. Uh, of course, that's led to a huge increase uh, in in some uh, salaries, um, and naturally, uh, attrition levels remain high. Um, in fact, according to the ONS, the biggest number of um, attrition, 75% of uh, attrition was actually related to job swapping and job hopping, um, probably from a reprioritization of, you know, people's priorities in life and boredom, which has led to a change in job and, of course, taking advantage of rising salaries. Um, so my question to you, John, is how sustainable is this? Uh, it looks, it seems as though this is going to set to continue into next year, but how sustainable do you think this is um, in terms of number of, you know, in terms of attrition um, and and salary increase for companies and employers? Well, I think you've got to, you know, we always assume it's going to revert back to normal at some stage, really. I think that um, given the, uh, as the economy is, as people accept the economy facing into next year, and we've seen the fellow scheme unwind, and we see uh, real attitudes on working from home, then there's just so many variables in that space at the moment where businesses are trying to get to grip with their working from home model, their recruitment model, their onboarding model. And this is compounding the issues of retention, I think. So um, it, it's a difficult environment to, to work in and, and uh, run an extended uh, business team around the world. But um, it's just impractical at the moment to, to, to consider that uh, you're going to see a lot of um, of the sort of job swapping or job jumping and quitting that we've seen in the US where some like, you know, extraordinary numbers there. So what one's got to assume is going to settle down as we get into steady state next year. And the critical thing at the moment is absorbing the, the furlough numbers. So 1.1 million on furlough at the end of uh, uh, September, we've yet to see how that's going to unwind uh, given the uh, recruitment difficulties that exist across those different sectors. So yeah, it's got, you've got to assume it's going to settle down at some stage, but uh, yeah, yeah was, absolutely. Uh, Thanks, John. I think we're certainly in agreement. Just, you just gone on mute there, Leila. Um, please. Um, because you said you're in, because you said you're in agreement. That's why she couldn't bring herself to say that's right. <laughs> that's right. No, please. Um, I mean, please. Again, just don't be shy. Put your comments in the chat. Tell us if you agree or disagree with Leila, John, on that. Um, Energy, John, um, there's a question in the chat around what impacts do you think we might feel on the inflation rate and the economy more directly from the from the dislocation we've seen in the energy market and the subsequent oligopoly being formed by the big six firms? Well, energy we look at, the old situation is pretty clear as, a, as input costs on energy. So you, First of all, at one level, we've not really seen a coherent grand plan from government about um, energy supply. And I think that, you know, working at the Chamber of Commerce a couple of years ago, businesses weren't so much worried about um, pricing, they were worried about availability and capacity. So I think that there's still questions about capacity moving forward on specific pricing that, you know, oil, oil is going to unwind and we see that inflationary impact 
uh, quite clearly from the analysis. That so no concerns there. Slightly more concerning about gas prices, given that you know the Russians they don't need to invade during the daytime. They just switch off the gas and go in where all the lights are out. Um, so I think there's implications for gas prices in Europe because of the dependency on the US, on, on the uh, the Russian supply situation there. But nevertheless, we've seen them come off the top um, by about 30% since the uh, uh, September, maybe August, September. So I think you've got to see some movement back to, to normality. OPEC, for example, that we worry about demand disruption. So it's got a, an element of prices falling back. Uh, EIA models $72 through next year as the price forecast for oil. That's West Texas, West Texas. but uh, equally, you know, gas prices are going to fall back. So I think the, yeah, the fundamentals suggest that prices are going to ease back into next year. Well, as for the um, monopoly situation, well, you know, I'd settle for big six has been a good competitive issue. When they were trying to increase the number of suppliers into the market, Really, as with banking, that means that you know the big guys got big for a reason, and we've seen one of it was the ability to forward buy and hedge. So I wouldn't worry about the big six, I, and I think the price trends mean there's adequate government regulation anyway to step in. But the fundamentals on oil and gas prices mean that, uh, and the capacity from uh, from um, alternative energy and nuclear investment, then you know the, the price pattern should stabilise quite quickly. I would think. You haven't mentioned the B word at all. Not that I heard Brexit during uh, the last 40 minutes. What's, yeah. what, what do you, and I know that was mentioned in the chat as well earlier. Um, what do you see as the impact that Brexit's had and will continue to have? Oh, my word. I don't mention it because it's so heartbreaking, really. I think that <laughs> you see that you, you, it, it's, I just don't, get it i don't understand why it happened and i think that uh, you know we always we always divided the box into these four boxes of you know four big reasons why political social business and economics and we would say you know political it's about uh, who governs britain that was a good question before brexit it's a pretty good question now political who governs britain social it was all about immigration yeah we need more of it um not coming over in dinghies but we need more of it there's there's eu workers Business and economics, we always said, forget it. There's no fundamental argument for leaving the EU. And there wasn't then, there isn't now, and everything is just um, compounding on the problem. So I think that, yeah, we, we know that truly global Britain means opening your doors to more imports from the rest of the world. And unfortunately, that means that that's not going to work out from a trade point of view. Okay. I'm going to ask one more question before I come to the floor and uh, make people feel awkward and ask them what their questions are. So um, <laughs> be ready for that. Um, John, are we anywhere near the, 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 the growing forces of ESG and the themes from COP26 having an impact on oil production, trending oil prices and the economy more generally, do you think? Yeah, I think that... Um, it's argued that's one of the reasons why the US capacity didn't come on stream as quickly as we would have liked. There were some disruptions from uh, the odd tornado here and there, but generally there is pressure on the oil companies to not to invest, and increase capacity and to disinvest. And that's why Biden was calling for almost a moratorium on some of those um, pressures relating to increasing capacity. So he's asked for more output from his producers in the US. But yeah, ESG is a big investment phenomenon at the moment. I mean, the governance issue has always been there and should have been there. And I think that that's 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 OK. The social issues, good pressure there. So I think the new phenomena is the is is COP26 and the, the pressure on on E. But I think that, you know, the, the big thing is getting to grips with uh, co-production in India and China realistically. And we can all half fill our kettles. And from the water authorities, we had a water assessment of our efficiencies. We were pretty efficient. And we also got an egg timer to plug into the shower to make sure we don't spend more than four minutes in the shower. So I think, you know, we can all do a little bit. I'm generally in for two minutes anyway. But yeah, I think we've seen some of that. It's, yeah, it's a pressure in the boardroom and a lot of time and effort being put in place to get it right. G was always there. S should always be there. And E, everybody now has got to do what they can. So yeah, it's a phenomena and it's um, it's exacerbated some of the pricing issues uh, through uh, 20, 
21 and into 2022. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so, as I threatened to do, I'm opening this up. Who, um, any, any questions for John from the floor? Stick your hand up or come off mute. Gosh, you're quite a lot. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going then. Um, John, I have a question, Paul. Okay. I have a question. I was just um, just looking at our, our poll results um, from the beginning. Some of you, uh, thank you for those who participated. Um, the top two uh, uh, wall of worry um, points that came out were supply chain uh, and recruitment and retention, uh, followed by the pandemic. But so I think the pandemic over time will ease. I am interested to hear from anyone um, what their reasons are uh, for voting and what the reasons are behind this. Agreement sanction, yes, that is uh, that's a little bit more transparent, but certainly any specific issues from anyone around supply chain that anyone would like to to share or discuss or ask John about. I'm particularly intrigued about that from any of our attendees. Maybe let's show the results. Um, Becky, if you wouldn't mind just showing the screen and we'll just see. So this is where you've all voted. Um, and that's a reasonably similar trend to how we started off with supply chain being being the major worry. Um, recruitment after that. Um, so yeah, as later says, I mean, John, you've spoken to that. Um, do you do you within that see that you know, the major dislocations being in supply chain being around uh, you know the where the ships are stuck, or do you see that more on the high streets? You know, where do you if you were reflecting on that wall of worry, what do you think the main trends are around that supply chain concern? Uh, supply chain is is very much. Um, in the, the the container issue that we we've talked about in some detail and specifically with the um, uh, chips you know chips with everything so big issues there relating to chips and then some of the sort of covid disruptions in southeast asia from a manufacturing point of view so yeah the supply chain has been is critical um yeah. but we, we've covered that in a lot of detail that that's got to unwind into as, as supply catches up and the containers get back in place and more capacity is brought back on stream. So, so when you see the, you know, where the concern that people point, uh, pinpoint here, do you, what do you think the, some of the lasting damage might be to our economy if these, if these concerns play out? I think generally after a, a setback, then the economists tend to worry too much about um, scarring. Uh, but I think overall, the economy is pretty resilient uh, in, the, in the service sector and in the construction sector, not so much in manufacturing. There is a risk we always lose capacity in manufacturing. And I think that um, there will be the same, you know, that, that there will be a risk that we do lose some additional capacity in the manufacturing sector, but uh, it just takes a bit longer to get back to where it was really. The big excitement about what's happening is um, you know, the growth of uh, the, the trend towards electric vehicles and uh, in the US they're getting very excited about autonomous vehicles. <laughs> Not too sure about that myself yet, but uh, you know, electric vehicles is, is really exciting and the, the potential for infrastructure layout with charging capacities increased across the super, across the, um, the motorways of the, of the UK means there's big investment potential there. So I think that's, that's really something to look forward to. As well as the usual stuff on, you know, AI and robotic uh, process yeah. automation, that sort of thing. But generally, yeah, maybe some scarring in manufacturing. But generally, I think that uh, there'll be a good recovery and good, good infrastructure investment. We want to see more on infrastructure with HS2 and HS3. That's not happening. We'll see what happens with the leveling up agenda. But um, you know, yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting investment opportunities uh, okay. for the UK specifically. So you're seeing us get back to trend and uh, almost continue business as normal. But question from John in the chat: Do you do you see the supply chain shock that you've described um, intensify the rising 
de-Chinification, I'm not sure that's a word, but I'll use it anyway, trend in the, in the medium term? De decoupling, we call it. But, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, no, I think that, um, yeah, you're going to see some elements of um, Samsung investments into the US on uh, chips, but I don't see that as being a big option for the UK because we just don't have the economies of scale. So I think, you know, there's a lot of worries about taper tantering and uh, um, just in time, just in time jitters, I would say. But really, it doesn't really work. I think we'll get back to assume normality as soon as possible. You may get jit adjustments on stock levels. So it's not just in time, it's just in time with a bit longer, just in case, as they call it. So I don't see any sort of real dislocation and reinvestment and onshoring uh, much in the UK at all, really. Maybe a little bit in Europe, in the US, but even then, you know, the economists are calling for reduction in costs, which means you don't bring it back on shore. That's even assuming you can find the workers and the skills anyway, which will be a yeah. big challenge. Yeah. And it's good to see, I think, in the, uh, or always refreshing to see, I think, in that in the analysis that Becky was showing earlier, where people have voted, that pandemic isn't top of people's worry at the minute. But it has obviously affected different people in society in different ways. Do you think we will see as we come out of the pandemic and the changes that you've described, John, do you see from a social justice perspective, do you think certain groups will become more marginalised post-pandemic? Well, I go back to, you know, we talk about levelling up, but the reality is that uh, um, child poverty is 4% in Richmond and 40% in Rochdale. And so that was the same before the pandemic. And it's the same now after the pandemic, and it's just getting worse, really. So I think that, you know, the same uh, social imbalances stand and the same challenges yeah. are, uh, are there. They'll always be there. So I don't think uh, yeah, the, the pandemic just compounded the basic issues and the fundamental issues. But, you know, child poverty, 4% in Richmond, 40% in Rochdale. Come on, that's like get that leveled up if you can. Yeah, absolutely. Well, look, John, thank you ever so much. Um, we're coming up to the top of the hour. Um, thank you very, very much. Again, that's an amazing statistic fueled session you've given us there. Um, if you've liked what you've heard, everyone, please feel free to contact us and discuss more. Um, everyone here at Petuity and Robert Half will, will be delighted to discuss with you some more. Um, as I mentioned at the top of the call, uh, at the top of the forum, um, we will be publishing next week our top risk survey, our Petuity top risk survey. We'll send you all a link to that and it'll be interesting to see how the risks we've discussed today and you've, and you've highlighted today, particularly around those top risks, correlate with that survey. Um, but John, once again, thank you ever so much. Um, our, challenge has ever has been, our challenge as ever to all of you is to put what, some of what you've heard today into action and address those risks. There'll be a video of our forum today on our website, so please feel free to share that with your colleagues, your friends, your LinkedIn contacts. Um, so until next time, everyone, on behalf of my Petuity and Robert Half team here, I'd like to extend you all our best wishes. Stay safe, be bold, be kind to each other, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, right. John.